Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. Bon appétit as well. <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome. Happy Monday, happy week four. Uh, welcome to the second salon of Candle Force Labs' new lecture series, Eyes in the Sky, Birds in the Heart and Mind. Before we start, I'd like to um, acknowledge native peoples. Um, so the University of California, Los Angeles, occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Tongva and Chumash peoples. As a land-grant land institution, we pay our respects to Hunukvetam ancestors, Ahi Irom elders, and Iyo Hinkem, our relatives, relations, past, present, and emerging. Last Monday, I had the great pleasure to uh, talk to my friends. At Counter Force, we presented the, uh, the new lecture series uh, that is a love letter to birds. Eyes in the sky, birds in a heart and mind is a love letter to birds and also to all the great energy and teamwork that went into, yes, we can sit now, uh, that went into uh, designing, producing, and installing the first Baufilia tree house in Encino. And by the way, um, Stay tuned because the inauguration is coming up. Um, so th this new series, just in a few words, uh, really focus on interspecies friendships, art and science collaborations, as well as drones capacity to enrich our empathetic connection to the natural world. And we also ask, what can we survey that cultivates a sense of awe and wonder? Uh, a big thank you to everyone at DMA for their help and support to make this lecture series a reality. And I also like to thank the UCLA Institute for Digital Research and Education for their support through a grant. My name is Eugen Muller. I'm a lecturer here and a member of Canoe Force. And today, I'm really pleased to be in conversation with Kate Cavanaugh. Hi, Kate, and welcome to DMA. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, Kate is a graduate student in the Geography Department at UCLA. Her work leverages a variety of perspectives for observing the population dynamics of coastal California kelp communities. This include data from emerging remote sensing technologies, such as satellites and drones, which allow for both local and regional scale quantification of how our changing environment is structuring coastal ecosystems. Kate is especially interested in refuge sites that may facilitate kelp recovery and dispersal. Um, so Kate, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today to explore how drones enable you and your team to obtain vital insights into kelp's importance in supporting life in our region. Um, Kate, I'd like to start this conversation by asking how kelp became your research focus? Yeah, so I know you're all probably expecting me to say something along the lines of how I grew up in the ocean and I'm super passionate about studying the ocean, which is true to a certain extent, but my path to kelp is actually a bit more roundabout than that. So I became broadly interested in ecology when I did my undergrad at Gettysburg College and I was studying environmental studies and physics, which might be an odd pair, but I wanted to be a wastewater engineer, which again is not the most glamorous job, but at the time I had been reading about how engineers and scientists were coming together and developing these systems where actually you could introduce wetlands into the wastewater system and it would help naturally filter some of the effluent that would then go back to the ocean. I just thought that was the coolest thing. But it took one summer of working in wastewater to realize it was not my dream job in life. And so I started doing research with my advisor and he was a remote sensing guy. So he used these really long time series of satellite observations to look at forests. And I thought that incorporating space as a variable for studying trees was really cool. So you could look at population A that was thriving right next to population B, which was not doing well, and then try to tease apart why the two were so different. And so I was interested in continuing looking at satellite data for understanding ecological phenomena, and I started working at 
the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab where I kept doing satellite observation work. And my advisor there was like, oh my gosh, your name is Kate Cavanaugh. You must be related to Kyle Cavanaugh. And I was like, I have no idea who that man is. I don't know a Kyle. My dad's name is, is Mike. My brother's name is Chris, whatever. Didn't think much of it. And then a couple months go by and someone else was like, oh my God, another Cavanaugh. And I was like, oh Jesus, who is this man? So I finally looked up Kyle Cavanaugh. Turns out he's a professor at UCLA. And I was reading some of his publications and immediately fell in love with his work. I didn't know anything about kelp forests, nothing, until I started reading his publications. And I reached out and applied and then kind of fell into it and fell in love with the science of it. So I know that was a long answer, but that's how I discovered these beautiful forests. This is how he discovered kelp. By accident, I happen to have the same last name as my advisor, so. Fantastic. Uh, another question on our pre-flight checklist is, I really wonder how you learn how to fly a drone. Um, we live here in LA, uh, and above us, we have a very complex airspace. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of what we call a sectional chart. Um, so this is how uh, aviation people uh, get their bearings. <laughs> um, I did very practical questions. How did you learn? Where did you learn? And any fun anecdotes? I was a mess. I started here as a master's student and the same time I started with Kyle, he had hired a technician and the technician was from Purdue and Purdue actually has a major that's focused on drones. So all you do is study drone technology and airspace and also how to process data and so the technician's name was Evan, and Evan was in charge of really ramping up Kyle's drone program within the lab. And so he was coming up with protocols on training new lab members on how to fly, training them how to process data, and then training them how to analyze that data. And so as he was really ramping up this technology, I became excited about it because if you're thinking about studying coastal ecology, it's so dynamic in terms of spatial and temporal scales. So spatial processes, there are spatial processes in the order of centimeters that can impact kelp canopy, right? Tides, currents, it's this really small scale phenomena. Then there are these large scale phenomena like marine heat waves or storm events that happen over really broad spatial scales, like kilometer scales. And then same temporally, there are waves or storms that can rip out canopy in seconds, but then gradual warming can eliminate a forest across decades. And so if you're thinking about how to study something like that, field work or, or diving gives you a really local scale perspective where satellite data gives you this regional to global scale perspective. And drones were that perfect middle ground where you can study these local scale phenomena, but at larger scales than you'd be able to with, with in situ observations. So when I talked to Evan, I was like, hey, I really wanna learn how to fly drones. And, he said, I first had to take my Part 107 FAA exam, which you and I were just talking about. So basically, it's, it's like taking your driver's permit test, but for drones. So you don't have to do any in-flight tests. You never have to hold a controller, but you have to take an online test where you sit and there's an observer who watches you and it's like a 60 question test. And they ask questions about you know, pre-flight checklists, flight safety, weather conditions, um, how much payload your drone can hold, just making sure you have a really good understanding of all the background on drones. And I'm happy to talk to anyone about this, but there are courses you can take to prep for that if anyone's interested in, in taking that test. I, I didn't take a course. I don't know if you took a course, did you? I was just watching videos online, That's right? what I did. Yeah. So that's what I recommend. You don't have to pay money to take a course. There's so many free online resources that you can use that are really helpful for passing this exam. Anyway, so I was studying for that exam with Evan, and he was also teaching me how to actually fly the drones. So we started out with this, not that one, that one's so big. We started out with this tiny little drone, maybe the size of a shoebox, and he Was it would, this one, though? No, um, this is it's also It's actually one even smaller than that. Okay. And so he actually brought me to a baseball field, and he made me fly as if I were running the bases and see if I could hover on all of the different bases just to get a really good idea of how fast the drone went, how quickly it stopped, how far I could go and still maintain line of sight. Because if you're flying a really small drone, if you send it a quarter of a mile, half a mile away, you immediately lose sight of it, which becomes a bit scary. And so I 
was very fortunate because I had someone there who really helped me with all of the steps along the way, both in terms of flying, obtaining those airspace privileges. So a lot of my work was done in Palos Verdes, which was in a sliver of the coastline that actually wasn't contained in any portion of those circles. I know it's hard to tell on this map, but there's like one point on PV that, that you didn't need any airspace um, access for. Mm -hmm. And so Controlled I got quite airspace, lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was also here, right, in Hermosa Beach, and then somewhere around here. Mm -hmm. um, and when did you first fly your drone by yourself? So you were working with uh, Evan. I worked Evan with and Evan then for a couple months, and mm -hmm. then I started flying by myself. And you know, things do go wrong. So one of the main things that I talked about with Evan, he would give me these scenarios where he'd be like, OK, you're flying 200 feet offshore. Your drone's 400 feet in the air, and a helicopter's coming in and you think that the helicopter's lower than your drone, what are you gonna do? And I'd be like, oh gosh, Evan, come on, you're giving me all these crazy scenarios. I kid you not, almost every scenario he gave me I've actually had to deal with, especially because the airspace is so complicated. Even if you're not in controlled airspace, you're destined to come into contact with other aircraft. And so I have crashed drones. Almost everyone in the lab has crashed drones. It, it happens, it's like, you know what they say about driving motorcycles when people are like, it's not if, it's when. Unfortunately, it's very similar for drones and you, you just have to make sure you're maintaining the equipment, you're following all the rules and that you're flying in situations that if it does go down, everyone's going to be safe. But all of my crashes have been totally fine. It's all worked out. Happy to talk about it more if anyone has questions, but. Did, did you crash any drones out uh, in the sea? I have or never no? crashed one over water. I've always gotten them back on land, and um, we've been able to salvage some parts, which has been fine. Okay, going back to kelp, uh, I wonder if you can tell us more about the importance of kelp here in our region. It, yeah. I, it's, a, it's a big question, I guess, but if you can yeah. give a few words. Um, so we have two major species of canopy forming kelps along the California coastline. Up north of San Francisco, we have bull kelp, and then south of San Francisco, it mixes, but we have giant kelp. And so they create these big, beautiful canopies on the water surface. And it's interesting because they're rooted to the bottom with a hold fast. So you can think of these like roots, even though they don't actually draw nutrients from the substrate, they're just used to attach to rocks. And then there are these fronds that extend from the hold fast through the water column, and you can think of those like plant stems. And then from the fronds are these hold fasts or gas-filled bladders that actually buoy blades to the water surface, and the blades are like leaves. And so it creates this three-dimensional structure from the ocean floor all the way to the ocean surface, and it supports a variety of different communities. So the holdfast supports a community, the midwater fronds support a community, and then the floating fronds support a totally different community. So there's an abundance of fish and invertebrates that depend on these forests, both for food, but then also for habitat. And people also use uh, or harvest kelp for a variety of different products. So like the toothpaste you used this morning or salad dressing or even cosmetics have different kelp products in them. So both in terms of ecologically and economically viable, um, it, is, it is very important for, for our ecosystem and for our economics. In previous lectures, you mentioned how kelp blades, and you just mentioned those kelp blades again, how they reach to the surface and they provide vital insights into what is going on underwater. Mm -hmm. um, and this is really one of the things that really fascinates me in your work, how airborne observations allow us to better understand underwater dynamics. Um, so I don't really have a question here for you, but I, I would love to hear your thoughts about how remote observations allow us to understand um, kelp better and you know the underwater dynamics there. Yeah, so we use canopy observations to get an idea of, of forest health and forest um, dynamics in general. And so, for example, one of the projects we're working on right now, their marine heat waves are a really big disturbance that are concerning coastal communities worldwide. Very similar to what you would consider like a normal heat wave in terrestrial life, I guess, but the water becomes anomalously warm and it's anomalously warm for a long period of time. 
And so we had a really big marine heat wave along the Pacific coast of North America from 2014 to 2016. It was a multi-year heat wave, it was huge. And in Northern California, it coincided with mass mortality of sea stars. So sea stars eat sea urchins, and then sea urchins are grazers on kelp. So they eat kelp. And in the absence of these sea urchins that had the mass die off, uh, sorry, sea stars, the sea urchin populations increased like crazy and then started grazing on the kelp. And the combination of this overgrazing and then heat stress from the heat wave resulted in a huge die off of kelp populations up there. So it was like 95% declines, which is totally unprecedented. We had never seen any declines like that, probably for like 30, 40 years. So totally unpredictable, very, very sad. And the California Department of Fish and Wildlife had done these aerial surveys since 1989, where they took a plane and they flew along the coastline and took imagery of the kelp canopy uh, almost every year. And so we had this idea of what populations had looked like up to that point, but funding ran out in 2016, which unfortunately coincided with the end of the heat wave. And so we didn't know where these populations had, had really declined, where they, they had persisted, and there were a lot of research projects coming out on the big decline, but I kept thinking if it was a 95% decline, there are still 5% of that population that has been able to survive. So where are they able to survive? Why are they able to survive? And so remember to date, a lot of my work had been done with satellite data. And you can think of a satellite image as almost like a blurry iPhone photo. So you can, when the population is big enough, you get a really good idea of how much kelp is there. But if you're looking at this tiny, fragmented kelp bed, you can't really see it with satellite data. So it presented this really cool opportunity to use drones to try and see where populations had been able to persist along this coastline. So probably a team of like 10, 15 pilots went up there and we flew 35 different sites along the coastline from 2019 to 2022. And combined with really high resolution satellite data, we started to take a look at where these populations persisted just based on their canopy, right? Just based on this above water perspective. And then combined it with some diver data and some environmental data to try to tease apart where these refuge populations were persisting, but also why. So I guess to answer your question, I think these, the presence of canopy can inform a lot more than just kelp presence, right? You can pair them with other data sets to try to untangle some drivers of, of dynamics along the coast. That's a very um, uh, profound answer. And we're, we're working with a uh, blue screen here, but that's okay. I guess we're, we're gonna do without. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I was gonna running around. I just try to yeah. unplug it and plug it back in. Um, but in, you know, preparing, our conversation today, um, I can't afford, we were really uh, inspired by this notion, this tension of you know how remote observations so or this sense of detachment in a way can help us get closer to a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, and you do this using drones and also images, which is um, the, the, the next question actually, how drone images bear evidence of those underwater dynamics. What do, what do you look for in those images? What do you see, what do you look for? I guess it depends on the, on the question that you're asking, but there are a lot of different things that we can look for. So in a lot of research questions, we're just looking for presence or absence. But also, I don't know if you remember some of the pictures that were just up on the screen, but you can actually get fine enough detail on some of those images where you can see differences in color in the fronds. So I don't know, you could probably see like some swirls or like very differing colors of brown and yellow in some of those images that were just up on the screen. And so when you, so when you're thinking about drones, right, there's obviously spatial resolution. So how fine of a detail can you tease apart in this image? And then there's temporal resolution, which is how often do you actually fly the drone. And then there's something called spectral resolution, which is how many channels in the electromagnetic spectrum is our sensor actually capturing. And so in really simple terms, right, your iPhone takes pictures in three channels, red, green, and blue. And so at least 
most of them, I don't know what Apple does now, but just generally, right? Red, green, and blue. And so our really simple drones do the same thing, where they just take pictures in red, green, and blue channels, which then you can manipulate to make look like color images, or what our eyes would see. And the more channels you add, so like let's say we add a yellow wavelength, and then we add some extra green wavelengths, and then we add some extra red wavelengths, and then we can actually extend past what we see with our eyes and capture information in wavelengths outside of what we can visualize, like the near infrared. And that can give us an indication of kelp health. So if blades are really dark, it means they're a lot healthier. And if they're a lot lighter, it means they're losing their photosynthetic pigments and they're not as healthy anymore. And so we're developing some of these tools where we're not only looking at kelp presence anymore, but also some of these metrics of kelp health, which is kind of cool, I think. I'm sure, and I had prepared a few slides to, to, to just illustrate what you just shared with yeah. us. But we're, we're now, <laughs> it's been very tem temperamental today, the it's system. Okay. So, um, but just for everyone, this notion that um, Kate, uh, by flying drones is looking into other wavelengths. If you have to imagine the whole electromagnetic spectrum, the visible spectrum, what we can see with our, uh, with our eyes. Thank you so much, Erin. I'm I just going to try and turn it off and turn it back on. Perfect. So. You didn't disconnect it completely from your computer. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's been very temperamental today. Um, hopefully, it's going to work. So, w with our eyes, we can only see a tiny portion of this spectrum, like a tiny, tiny little portion. And Kate, I had a diagram, maybe we can uh, wait a little longer and it's gonna work, but uh, the near infrared is just after the, the visible spectrum. So these are wavelengths we can't see with our, with our human eyes. Um, but these wavelengths are, in a way, it's critical for your work because mm -hmm. you, you, you get a lot of information. This is what, what I meant by, you know, what do you see in, in those images? Because yeah. here you, you can really see and get vital insights into Yeah, it captures health. more information than we can see with our eyes, which is really cool. So even if you think about like trees and the way that they photosynthesize, there are certain pigments um, that they use for photosynthesis. So let's say chlorophyll A really likes pulling from the red portion of the spectrum. And for kelp fucoxanthin really likes pulling from the blue portion of the spectrum. And there aren't really very many pigments or if any in kelp that pull from that near infrared signal. And so if you're looking at the reflectance or the signal of kelp in all these channels, it kind of throws all that light back. It reflects all of that near infrared light back that it doesn't use for photosynthesis, making that signal really strong. And so you can look at some of these different features to then tease apart, okay, how much chlorophyll A is in here? How much fucoxanthin is in here? How much chlorophyll C is in here? And even just using the near infrared signal to detect kelp presence is easier because the signal is often a lot higher than in the visible because it reflects that light back so, so strongly. And how do you prepare your, your images? So you acquire just the acquisition mm -hmm. phase, and then how do you prepare, how do you process your images to, to reveal these phenomena? Yeah, um, so you can think about it almost like if you're playing dominoes, you know, you, you hit the first domino and then all the dominoes fall, and then when they're laying there, they have quite a bit of overlap with one another. Drones image really similarly. So it follows this long mower pattern where it will take a snapshot, move to the next spot, take a snapshot, take a snapshot, take a snapshot. And all of those snapshots overlap with each other just like you could imagine those dominoes laying in a row. And then you upload those images to some sort of orthorectification software. There's a, about a billion out there now, so it, I don't know if it really matters which one you use anymore. but. It will use all those individual snapshots and then look for similar features. So let's say it took a picture of a kelp frond in this one. And then as it moved to the next position, half of that kelp frond is still visible. It can actually detect that that's the same kelp frond in both images and then stack those on top of one another. And so at the end, you get this seamless product of whatever you took that one strip of. So that's, that's our method for processing the data. And do you combine visible images and near-infrared images? It depends on the sensor. So we have four different drones, each with different sensors. So one of them is just viz, so RGB, or red, green, and blue. And then we also have a multispectral sensor, which is four bands in the visible and then one in the near-infrared. 
And then that big drone, that picture was up before, we have like over 250 bands in the visible and the near infrared. I can see many parallels between how scientists and artists use images and what you just uh, mentioned about the, those time series. We do time lapses or we do sequences you yeah. know, of, of pictures, but also the images that we use are processed as well and they enter specific language and to achieve specific results. But I, I can see many parallels between um, how artists and scientists use images and um, you know the transformation we apply to them. Um, and, and there's also, it seems to me, this, this idea that images are little windows on you know, specific phenomenon that we'd like to understand and, and describe. Mm -hmm. um, so do you, do you stitch all those pictures together? You just mentioned this software. What, what, you didn't mention any software in particular, oh. but you, you, you stitch all those pictures together and you create this, I guess, very large maps or mm -hmm. orthographic. Can, can you ortho say mosaic. ortho yeah. mosaic? So can you maybe use... explain what an ortho mosaic yeah, composition is? Sorry. So it's just like um, so all those individual images that the drone takes, it will stitch them all together, and then every pixel actually actually has a latitude and a longitude associated with it. So it's not just an image that you can look at. You can actually spatially project where each one of those pixels is. So it's able to to spatially rectify not only all the images together in a mosaic, but then place it on a map as well. And I think uh, the projection, we, we're it's live back. again. See, look at all yes. those different colors. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gareth and Aaron. Thank you so much, um, which is perfect because I wanted to circle back very, very quickly to, to this here. Ah, oh, it's no. blue again. <laughs> I just wanted to. It's interesting. One, two, three. The technology, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It's all good. Oh, there. There we go. Um, so, this is a, a kind of basic diagram where you can see the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is the, the tiny little band in which we can see. But you were working. You mentioned the near infrared, so I suppose if I can have my pointer here. Yeah, yeah so just right just the here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing I wanted to circle back to, and it was also um, the notion of multispectral images. Uh, and you kindly shared these images with me this morning, and so I could could you. Um, Describe yes. what we're looking at here, please. So this is data. This is actually satellite data. So it's from oh, satellite. Okay. Uh, it's from a constellation of small satellites called Planet Scopes. Probably my favorite data ever. And so there are over 120 satellites that image in tandem, and it gives you close to daily data globally at three meter resolution, which is just nuts. It's like kind of unprecedented data. And so. On the left, I'm just showing the red, green, and blue channels, kind of what I was talking about. It gives you a true color projection of what's on the ground, very similar to what we would see with our eyes. And then in the right, I'm just zooming into a kelp bed. This is in Northern California. And on the bottom, instead of showing the red, green, and blue channels in red, green, and blue, I'm showing them in near infrared, red, and green. And so you can see that the vegetation looks so bright. It also looks obviously is in the wrong color, like right, that's, we don't see vegetation as red, but it pops as very bright because vegetation reflects that near infrared right, light back quite strongly. And so if I, because the vegetation on land is a lot stronger than the vegetation coming off the signal of the water or the kelp, um, the kelp looks a bit darker, but especially if there were some sort of intertidal algae or something that was submerged or subsurface in the water. If you ignore the land and you're just thinking about marine algae, this near infrared signal makes kelp quite strong, which helps you differentiate it from the water and then other species that might not be floating. Wonderful. Yeah. It's just different and ways of visualizing bands that we can't see with our eyes. And can you touch upon this massive scale project that you mentioned in a lecture um, you acquired? So suppose many images such as these and you created this big map of all those kelp forests from Baja all the way to Oregon if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah it goes to Washington now. Wow. It, so my advisor Kyle Cavanaugh started the project during his PhD 
They're called the Landsat satellites. They started imaging in the early 80s. So I was talking about this a little bit earlier, but and they're still ongoing, so they still collect data today. So we have this 40-year record of a time series of the Earth's surface. And so he and then other colleagues at Woods Hole developed a method for identifying kelp canopy with these data, and we've continued to apply it to different regions. So now we have these long-term data sets of kelp canopy along basically the entire coast from Baja all the way up to Washington that have been pretty monumental in helping us trying, try to tease apart the drivers of changes in kelp canopy through time. So it's a combination of satellite imagery and then drone imagery. And so you, you mentioned the resolution, the, the very small resolution of uh, yeah, so drone imagery. So you were filling the gaps, I suppose, like the Landsat images and data sometimes was kind of lacking and you, you flew a drone there in those areas to recover, in a sense, recover yeah, data you know, there. Yeah, even just comparing the time series of Landsat to some areas that we collect data with with the drone is interesting to see how much canopy we're actually missing with the satellite data. So doing some comparisons to see where are we doing a really good job with the satellites and what are some places that you know we might need finer scale to look at. And here we're looking at uh, pictures of field work. Um, was it a, a recent mission? Yeah, this yes. was like a, probably like two months ago. What, was it in the Santa Barbara area? This is in area? Santa Barbara, yeah. Wonderful. Um, I guess we can uh, watch this video here. This is uh, kelp footage, yes. Um, and this leads me to the last question I have for you today. Yeah. Uh, have you ever considered using those images in other like contexts, like maybe art projects, or uh, did have you ever printed some of some of your images here? Is, is it something you might be tempted to explore? Been. Or um, I am like the least artistic person ever. Even when it comes to making figures for papers, I'm the worst. But there are other people in the lab who. Like the, one of my colleagues, Kyle Emery, is the one who took this video, and he has really gotten good at photography with drones and video with drones, and he started doing prints as well. So I personally am not, but there are other people in our lab that have an eye and a, and a mind for that that are starting to do it. Great. Yeah. And, and with that, Kate, um, thank you so much for stopping yeah, by and, and opening windows on your research on drones and the world of Cape today. Thank you very much. Yeah. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them or talk later. Uh, yeah, if you can raise your hand and I will find you with a mic, with this mic, if you have questions. We can, we can clap, yeah, we can applause. <laughs> So how is the, the overall health of the kelp forest now in the California Bite? It depends where you look. So there, after that heat wave that ended in 2016, the initial response basically along the whole coastline was pretty bad. Like kelp declined pretty uniformly along the whole coast, but then it was really variable in the way it started to recover. So there are certain sections of coastline that have totally come back better than ever. And then there are other sections of coastline that are still quite dismal, like the area in Northern California. So it's been seven years and we still haven't seen a sustained recovery up there. So, but it also differs because there are some sections of coastline that, you know, it was only heat stress that was experienced. And then like Northern California, as I mentioned, also had a biological stressor um, in the urchins. So, different drivers, different states of canopy. Like Monterey is also experiencing kelp declines right now, um, and people are trying to tease apart why. So I think it just depends on where you look. But in the LA area, Santa Barbara area, it's doing just fine. There are some sections where like we had wildfires up there, and sometimes as the ash runs off into the ocean, it can create really turbid waters which make it hard for kelp spores to settle and then it limits the light, has a hard time growing. So there's also local pockets like that that aren't doing well. Yeah. That was wonderful. I'm loving all the kind of, you know, very detailed technicalities of even just the way we see and how we sense and how mm -hmm. we can expand our way of sensing the world. But I think that, you know, just staying a little bit more in 
terms of the populations. I know that in Los Angeles, um, in our area here, the um, reintroduction of the sea otter still is pretty contentious, right? There is not necessarily that top predator that would help by eating the sea urchins. So how is it, like how, do you imagine that that could bring a stronger health of the kelp to the kelp because the sea urchins continue to to cause havoc across. And the other question, just together with that one, is whether the a starfish population has recovered mm -hmm. and is helping, of course. Yeah. So in terms of of otters, I am not an expert on otters, but there is a lot of research that shows the dynamics between urchins, otters, and kelp, and of course they're they're very connected and linked. Um, I know that at least in Northern California, so far, the sea stars really were one of the main predators on urchins and, and their demise along with that big population increase has been the main driver. So I can't really speak to what would happen if, if otters were reintroduced there, but in terms of sea stars, there are some that have been observed like tiny sea or, or sorry tiny starfish that are starting to come back which is really promising and also there there are certain labs like Friday Harbor Labs up in Washington is trying to figure out how to um, grow the sea stars in the lab so that we can start reintroducing them to some sections of coastline so some people are hopeful and some people aren't and I think we just need a couple more years to see what nature does we had a slight recovery of kelp in 2021 up there, and then 2022, it got knocked right back down again. So, not really sure yet. Yeah. Other questions? Hi, thank you so much for coming yeah. today and sharing your fabulous research with all of us. I love the photography too. Um, so I study birds and I've always just been curious, how do birds respond to drones? Like when you're flying drones near a seabird colony, how does that colony respond and what precautions do you take to minimize disruptions? Not well. Uh. <laughs> I imagine not, but, <laughs> but it's so valuable to have this data. No, no. Like, I, I assume that there's a, there's a trade-off to be had. So our drones have gone attacked by seagulls before, for sure. And then there are other birds that have tried to... I don't, I'm not a bird I expert. love that you used the word attack. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> and then uh, there are other birds, I don't know what type they are because I'm not really familiar with them, that have tried to dive on the drone because they think it's threatening. Um, but and when something like that happens, we immediately land it. We try to, like as soon as the bird is far enough away, then we bring the drone back and land it and wait um, or we'll just kind of cut that, that flight for the day and come back another day. And then there are a couple flights in Northern California where there are these small islands that we fly the kelp beds that are right, they're like right next to these islands and the islands host these large colony of, of birds. And if we're flying and the birds seem disturbed by the drone, like let's say I'm flying over the island right next to the island and all of them get up and start to fly away, I, I have to immediately land. Like the CDFW tells me I have to land. And then you have to report how many birds you disturbed and then submit that report. And so people do take it seriously. And if you fly close enough, it's, it's, it's not hard to, to make them upset, which is unfortunate. But if you're flying high enough, they don't seem to mind. It's really when you're taking off and landing, when you're like quite low to the ground, that they tend to start to freak out. Has there has been any discussion about minimizing use of drones near those colonies when they're actively breeding? Yeah, hundred okay. percent. Yeah, that 100%. might be a, a really good strategy because I yeah. imagine they're more especially upset the breeding. Like we need permits and all of that, and um, they're quick to reject, especially if it's a breeding season. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm curious if you also work in collaboration with people that are looking at either the marine or more, I guess, above water communities, so linking the scale that you look at with more fine scale community dynamics. Um, yeah, broadly. Just in terms of like uh, like divers or something like that, or yeah, I think at the beginning of your talk you talked about how there are these like more fine scale studies you can do with divers in the kelp, and then you can do these satellite level 
studies, um, but your studies are really interesting with the drones because you're getting much more at these like kelp dynamics at a semi-larger scale, but I'm wondering if you're linking that back into processes at community dynamics beyond the kelp, so interspecies yes. community dynamics. Yeah, so that project that with the really big drone that keeps popping up on the screen is a project that I'm collaborating with divers at UC Santa Barbara. So they go out and dive every time that I fly the drone, and then we're going to be pairing their subsurface community measurements with my above water kelp canopy measurements. So taking a look at some of these metrics of kelp presence and kelp health, and then looking under the water and seeing, okay, what type of substrate was occupied? What type of invertebrate community was there? Um, how much fire ash was on the ground? And then trying to link together all of these pieces to see if there's any bigger picture dynamics we can start teasing apart. Yeah, which is really cool. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, I thank hey. you for the talk. Um, my background's in computer vision, so I was sort of wondering, like, once you get the data, how do you quantify, like, how much um, kelp there is? Like, is it on a per pixel basis? Do you have some segmentation that you're running on top of it? Um, yeah. So there are, it depends on the data set, and we have a couple of different ways of doing it. So we have really simple thresholding metrics that we can use if the data are really clean. But we also have a neural network that we're using now. So if you feed it a, an image, just like an RGB image of, from a phantom or one of those simpler drones, um, it just spits out a binary yes or no. There's kelp here classification based on, on training data that was manually segmented. And then we also have like random forest models and binary decision tree models that we can run on the, that's what we use for the satellite data. But we're moving more towards neural network based approaches for those as well. Okay, cool. Also, I had a follow-up question. I think someone mentioned something. I think there was a, a moment where you're talking about you have like satellite imagery, and then you also have like this drone imagery that you're using to kind of. And so naturally, I think the thing that popped up into my head was like super resolution. Are you like enhancing that satellite imagery with this drone? Stuff? We are not doing any. We haven't so far done anything in terms of creating a new data set based on like training the satellite data with the resolution from the drone data. What I was really interested in doing at one point was trying to do super resolution, but in terms of hyperspectral, not in terms of, of spatial resolution. So if we could take a satellite image with four bands or five bands and make some sort of correlations with a hyperspectral data set and then make this really high spatial, high temporal resolution data set into a hyperspectral data set as well based on those correlations, that would be really cool. But there is still quite a bit of pushback, especially from ecologists, because then some people are still arguing that that's data that's made up, right? It's not yeah. real data. So in terms of how well you trust it based on correlations with neighboring observations, I think that's still something that isn't quite explored yet. But I'm super interested in it. I think yeah. it's so cool. I totally feel that. I used to work in the medical space, and there's a lot of similar pushback, and like that's all made up data. Right. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That sounded fascinating. Any other questions? I actually have a question for you, Kate. Yeah, okay. You mentioned an underwater drone. Yeah, we did. In our got conversation, an latest conversation. <laughs> is, is it the, the, the device that you hold in this picture here? Um, the first picture. It was on the screen here. Is it? Is it? Is yeah. it the drone? Is it? Yeah. The, so yeah? <laughs> we have someone on the shore that was getting ready to control it, and then I go out and swim it as deep as I can, and then it it takes off. So it's basically tethered to the shoreline, so we can't lose it. Um, and then we send it out along different transects, and it takes video of the ocean floor or even midwater fronds if we wanted it to. So that's something that we've been working with recently, which has been really fun. Yeah, that's awesome. I know. I, <laughs> I was telling someone, I can't remember who, but I'm so used to looking at kelp from this top-down perspective that the first time I put this in the water and then looked at the camera, I almost started crying because I was like, oh my God, it's so beautiful under there. It's just something I, I really wasn't used to or hadn't had much experience with. So it's been very fun to use that tool. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And with that, um, oh, another question. Yes, I know that this is 
so fascinating. So <laughs> now what I would like to maybe talk a little bit about is like, what do we do with that information, right? It's like, um, I know that in so many ways, the ways that we have been using plastics, now there's so many wonderful uh, uh, technologies around utilizing kelp instead of plastics, right? So in water uh, bottles that we use kelp instead and, you know, um, uh, clothing, uh, uh, all kinds of other products that we're beginning to understand the 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 ways in which kelp can replace a lot of the petrochemicals and really using natural uh, um, uh, materials. So, do you know much about that? Are you kind of looking into the whole farming aspects of it? Um, kelp drops to be able to carry the CO2. So, I don't know if there's anything around that uh, that you could. Share with us. Yeah, so in terms of the biogeochemistry, I am not an expert, but in terms of, of farming, so we were involved in this project through the Department of Energy where they were looking to, like, the most efficient way of implementing kelp farms, right? And so our piece was monitoring. So if you're a kelp farmer, it's not really easy or cost effective to send divers out all the time to monitor these farms, see how they're doing, when are they ready to be harvested? And so we were really trying to come up with end-to-end -end systems using drones for how we could go out, monitor the canopy, see when it's ready for harvest, and then the optimal time to be using these for developing different types of products. So we were more on the back end, in, I guess, in terms of the question that you're, you're asking, but it is a really cool space to be in because kelp is becoming really popular and, and it is becoming part of the public domain. So. Hopefully we can we can help automate some of that at least in terms of monitoring. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much yeah, once of again, course. Kate. No, thank you guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>